So now I'd like to introduce our speaker for this lecture, Dr. Don Teeter. Dr. Teeter is a family physician who has worked in Western North Carolina for the past 32 years. Since 2004, he's focused on the intersection of pain, opioids, and addiction. He was lead facilitator for the expert panel during the development of the CDC guidelines for prescribing opioids for chronic pain. From 2013 to 2016, Dr. Teeter was the medical advisor to the National Safety Council teaching or leading the efforts to reduce opioid abuse and overdose in the community and in the workplace. He continues to work with federal and state programs and organizations, medical organizations, nonprofits, and addressing many aspects of the opioid epidemic. In 2018, Don and his wife Martha moved to Denver, Colorado. While, while working on the public health aspects of the opioid epidemic through public speaking and lobbying, he also sees patients one day a week treating opioid use disorder and chronic pain in Waynesville, North Carolina by telemedicine. He also works one, one week each month as a pain and addiction specialist seeing Alaskan Native patients with the Southeast Alaska Regional Health Consortium in, in multiple communities in Southeast Alaska. So without further ado, I will um, get you to Dr. Teeter and then he will carry us to lunch and then pick back up thereafter. Good. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate the chance to be back with you all today. I apologize that I can't be there. Um, uh, as you heard, because of COVID, we're able to do this remotely now, but also because of COVID, I can't be there. So I got sick a couple of days ago and uh, had already checked into my flight to arrive. And I'm sorry, sorry that I couldn't make it. I always enjoyed your conference. Uh, I want to thank the folks at Northern Healthcare for inviting me again this year. And uh, I, I hope this works as well by, uh, by presenting virtually. Um, I'll start by saying that, you know, I really am a, a, a pain management specialist now and, and still do some addiction treatment. But all of this really started back in, in 2000 when I started seeing, uh, in, in my primary care practice, I began seeing people addicted to opioids in the Southern Appalachian Mountain area and uh, began treating them with buprenorphine. Um, that really changed my life. And, and if, if you guys aren't prescribing buprenorphine, I'd really encourage that. It, it, it just changed my life. Uh, I, I began to see all these folks that had been, got addicted by me and, and, and my colleagues basically, and, um, and got trapped in this disease of addiction with, with no way out. And, and, and for many of these people, I really think they can't get off the opioids without some help. Um, and buprenorphine was that help and help people get their lives back to normal. So as, as I began to do that, I, again, I realized that many of them got addicted from me and my colleagues. So I started to look at how we treat pain and found that the things I had learned in, in, in uh, medical school and residency weren't really correct. Uh, we've got this really new understanding of pain and what we can do about it. And I hope to share that with you today. So first part of this talk will be a little bit of a re review if you've heard me before. Um, if not, I think you'll find this pretty interesting. Uh, it's kind of setting the, the basic science of, of what we know about pain and, and pain management. And then we'll get into some of the basic treatments, but then we'll really focus uh, at the last part on, on what's new in the past couple of years in both acute and chronic pain management. And there's some pretty exciting stuff. So I'm a member, a member of the International Association for the Study of Pain, and I went to their international conference a few weeks ago in, in Toronto. And these are mostly scientists. There's a few of us clinicians that go, um, but it's really exciting to hear all the, all the stuff that's going on uh, in research and pain management. And I think there's gonna be a lot of changes over the next few years. Um, and we're gonna be doing things even significantly different than we are now. Uh, but I'm excited to share some of this stuff with you guys. I'll start by saying that I have nothing to disclose. And I start most of my talks out with this quote. It says, opioids are the most potent medications we have for the treatment of pain. That's what I was taught. I think that's probably what most of us were taught. That's what most of us believe. You know, I mean, we've, we've been in the emergency room, I think most of us, and we've seen the patients come in with severe trauma and you inject that morphine and immediately they begin to relax and calm down and, and, and seem to feel a lot better. So we've even experienced some of this. Uh, but in fact, um, the issue with this is that we have tended to confuse potency with efficacy. So in fact, opioids are not very efficacious for pain and I'll share that a little bit later, but they are very potent and they are also very calming, which is actually their main benefit in acute trauma. 
Um, they, they help people calm down and relax. Uh, and there, there is some significant long-term benefits of that as well. And, and I think I'll talk about that later uh, also. But as far as actually reducing pain, they don't do so well. Um, they do okay, but we've got some better options and, and we're, we're gonna talk about that in a little bit. So this is a report that came out from the CDC a number of years ago, probably 10 years ago now, I think this is 2012, but it showed that increase in opioid prescribing that began in the 1990s and really increased on a, on a linear fashion for about 15 years. Um, and I was a part of this. Uh, you know, I started practicing in, in 1988. So initially when I started practicing, we didn't use many opioids. Um, but then as time went on, we began to hear from the Purdue Pharma rep and others that opioids were safe, opioids were effective, and we should be using more of these. And I began prescribing more, became really comfortable prescribing them. Um, in fact, obviously too comfortable. But when this report came out, it showed that, that parallel to that increase in opioid prescribing, we we're seeing a, a, an increase in opioid deaths and uh, an increase in treatment uh, admissions for people for opioid use disorder. So this is really the first report that came out and said that our increase in opioid overdose deaths and, and addiction uh, is directly related to the number of opioids that we prescribe. <clears throat> Excuse me. I still have some of those COVID symptoms, so I will pause occasionally. Um, so this really kind of opened our eyes that, that you know this opioid prescribing maybe is not the greatest thing. And, and actually some reports came along later looking at uh, the amount of pain we have in the United States. A number of reports came out uh, in, in around 2015, 2016, showing that during this increase in opioid prescribing, we've also had an increase in chronic pain, uh, disabling pain, people on disability because of pain. So it really began to show us that even though we're prescribing more, uh, we're not having really any benefit from it or no significant benefit. In fact, we have more people in pain. So let's talk about that. I think some of the problem is we don't really understand pain and, and we don't get a lot of education in this. So I'm gonna talk just briefly about it. Uh, I could easily talk several hours about this. And, and I think in, uh, in a presentation that you all would find pretty interesting, but I've, I've shortened it up to just a few minutes. So we'll hit the high points. So basically it's important to understand that acute pain and chronic pain are two completely different things. Um, and, and I was never taught this. I didn't understand this. And, and many providers still practice as though they are the same thing, but chronic pain has just gone on a, long, a longer time. But in fact, we know now they're complete, two completely different mechanisms. They have different causes. Uh, they have different solutions. Uh, and if we keep treating chronic back pain, for example, chronic back pain, if we keep treating that, it's just a long-term back problem. Uh, we're not gonna have good outcomes. So acute pain is, is really pain that we understand. Usually there's either tissue damage or a threat of that damage. Uh, it's, acute pain is like a warning for us. It's an alarm. It's, it's a warning sign that something is going on so that we will respond to it in a way that will make it better. And uh, we do, and it's helpful. And, and, um, and as we respond to it and pay attention to whatever's hurting, it gets better and we recover. Um, people that lose the feeling of acute pain have a worse outcome. So you think of people with diabetic neuropathy, right? We do monofilament testing on their feet to make sure that they still have feeling because once they lose that, then they have worse outcomes. And then they have to be visually expect inspecting their feet. And, and the leading cause of amputation today is diabetic neuropathy and diabetic ulcers. So acute pain is helpful. If you can feel that sore, you're gonna pay attention to it, you're gonna get better faster. Leprosy is another example of a condition where people lose the feeling of pain. And we've all seen pictures of people with leprosy that have parts of their hands or fingers amputated because the same thing happens. They get an injury or sore, don't pay attention to it, gets infected, still don't pay attention to it because it doesn't bother them. And, and then ultimately it gets into the bone and they need an amputation. Chronic pain, oh, well, let me finish by saying with acute pain, acute pain gets better as the tissue heals up. So again, that's really the way pain is supposed to work. That's the way we were created or the way we evolved um, so, that, so that the system works. Chronic pain though is very different. Chronic pain is pain that goes on for longer than three months generally. It's harder for us to find the exact source of that pain. So people will tell us they've got chronic back pain 
we may do an MRI and see different lesions all along their back. We don't know which one's actually causing the pain. In reality, for people over the age of 40, we can do an MRI on any of them and they'll have abnormalities that'll show up throughout their spine, but they might not be hurting from it. So it's hard to say that, that um, chronic pain is actually coming from one particular spot. In fact, if it was coming from that herniated disc, they ought to be able to take their thumb and point to the one spot where they hurt, but they don't. You ask somebody with chronic back pain where they hurt and they motion over their entire lower back. Think of fibromyalgia, they hurt over their entire body. Uh, chronic daily headaches, their whole head hurts. So chronic pain is much more generalized. It's hard for us to find an exact source where that pain is coming from. And also with chronic pain, we respond to chronic pain in a way that actually makes it worse. So in acute pain, we respond in a way that makes it better, but chronic pain, we respond in a way that makes it worse. So everybody with chronic pain gets better with exercise. Everybody gets better with being outside some. Everybody gets better with uh, uh, increasing their socialization and going back to work. Um, um, but we respond to it by being less active, by staying inside, uh, by going to church less frequently, by you know staying home from work, uh, by spending more time in our bed or chair. And all of that makes chronic pain worse. So we get in this cycle of, of less activity, uh, less socialization. Uh, we begin to develop more pain that makes us even less active. Now we're starting to develop depression. Depression makes pain worse. So we get in this really, this downward cycle that makes it worse and worse. And what we actually know that is a lot of chronic pain is caused by a neurologic disorder. It's caused by an, an overactivity of the pain signal that's sending pain signals to our brain so people hurt, but it shouldn't be sending those signals. Um, so we'll, we're gonna talk about that a little bit and what we can do about that. But as we think about it, acute pain is really a symptom. Uh, it's a symptom that something's going on and we got to pay attention to it. And as we do, it gets better. Chronic pain is a disease in itself. And again, it's caused by changes to our neurologic system uh, in a way that we feel more pain than we should and that we feel pain when we shouldn't at all. Um, and and uh, we respond to that in a way that actually makes the neurologic problem even worse. And again, gets us in this downward spiral that we need to help break people out of. So this is the definition of pain by the International Association for the Study of Pain. And again, I'm a member of this group. It's probably the, the, the most respected uh, pain organization in the world. And they describe pain as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with or resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage. So the, the change they made in 2020 was adding this section that says resembling that associated with because some people don't have actual or potential tissue damage. Those are the people that have these neurologic changes that are sending signals to their brain that make them hurt. And it feels just like real pain, but there is no actual or potential tissue damage. Uh, so that change has, has helped us uh, really with the understanding of pain for a lot of our folks in chronic pain. And I'll, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But one thing I wanna focus on here in this definition is that it says that pain is both a sensory and an emotional component. So I didn't learn about that way, about pain that way. And, and most of us didn't. We've, re we've realized that some people have this emotional response to pain, but, but, but our emotional state at the time we're feeling pain is really important in how we feel pain. And it's important for two reasons. Uh, one is the emotional, our emotional um, state when we're, when we're in pain actually increases the sensory input. Uh, the sensory aspect of our pain. So we measure the sensory aspect of pain with the zero to 10 scale that we share with people. What is your pain on a, on a scale of zero to 10? So if they have an injury that would normally make their pain about a three, and yet they're depressed or they're anxious, uh, or uh, you know maybe they think this injury is gonna affect their life in some way, such as not enabling them to go to work where they won't be able to earn the money this week that they need to pay their bills, and they have this emotional distress because of that, that alone will increase their pain from a three to a five. It makes them hurt worse. But also the emotional uh, aspect of pain is important because that's what, caused, that's what leads to the suffering from pain. So people that have a lot of emotional distress while they're having pain are suffering more. People that don't have emotional distress uh, while they're having pain, they don't suffer as much. And interestingly, uh, studies have shown that, that those of us that, that provide medical care to these folks, 
even though we're asking them where their pain is on a zero to 10 scale, which measures the sensory aspect, we are actually treating their pain based on their emotional response and their suffering. So people that have more of an emotional response and are suffering more are more likely to get more pain medications than those people that have less emotional uh, distress. So we have kind of recognized this in our souls. And I think all of us really recognize that, that you know, our role as primary care providers is just not to treat the disease, but it's to treat the individual and to address the, the rest of this that's going on. So that emotional aspect is really important. And, and we've kind of addressed that before, uh, maybe subconsciously, because we haven't done real well uh, assessing it at the bedside so much uh, in, in an objective way and recording that. What's not mentioned here, but is also important to understand is that there's also this cognitive aspect of pain. And we understand the cognitive aspect of pain as the placebo effect or even the nocebo effect. What we think about pain actually affects how we feel the pain. So if, if you or, or one of your, let's, let's say, say one of your patients has either acute or chronic pain and they come to you for help, if you were to hand them a sugar pill and you tell them this is gonna really help your pain, just because they trust you, just because they believe you, when they take that pill, their pain will decrease on average about 20%. Um, and that's called the nocebo effect. And that's actually an important part of pain management. The opposite of that is the nocebo effect. And to be honest with you, our patients experience the nocebo effect because of our behaviors uh, more than really anything else that they experience. So the nocebo effect will occur if they come to us and we tell them, oh man, you blew your knee out. You're going to really hurt for the next couple of weeks. Um, first of all, by telling them they're going to hurt, that'll increase their pain by about 20%. But also there were some of the words we use when we tell them they blew out a joint, they have this vision of this explosion in their joint and all this damage that's being done that actually makes them have worse outcomes. So if they come to us with a torn ACL and, and we use terminology like that, they're gonna have worse outcomes than if they come to us and we say, gosh, you tore a ligament in your leg, in your knee, that ligament is about half as big as my little finger. It can be fixed. It will repair, it, it will be repaired. You can be back to normal in no time. You know, we'll get you in therapy. Um, you're gonna hurt a little bit now, but it won't be that bad and it's gonna get better and you don't need to suffer from this. If we talk that way, their pain is significantly reduced. So really how we report injuries to our patients or how we report their diseases even have a significant output uh, outcome on their, uh, on their final outcome and how they do. So as we think about pain, I want us to think about pain really in these three dimensions, the sensory, the cognitive, and the emotional. Uh, and at the center of this lies the patient experience. So in the past, historically, we've just looked at this sensory aspect of it and we're missing so much more. So this applies to both acute and chronic pain. We need to be looking at these, we need to be addressing these uh, and, and, and people are, our, our patients will have better outcomes. So what's important to understand um, as we're assessing pain or as we're trying to understand pain better is that our brain changes how we feel pain. It modulates this sensory aspect of pain and how much we feel it. And it can do it to a dramatic degree. So this is really how it works. This guy has stubbed his toe and you see in circle one there on the left that the inflammation from his injury has activated the, the cytokines and all those other inflammatory uh, um, chemicals. And they actually activate then our pain fibers, our pain neuro, uh, nerve fibers that then begin to send this signal to our brain. And again, this is a warning signal. So these fibers have identified something's going on. They start to send this warning sign to our brain. It goes along the nerve fiber, which when it starts in our foot is pretty long. It goes all the way to the spinal cord goes in, you see in circle two there, it goes into the, the dorsal ganglion and, the, and to the dorsal horn of uh, the spinal cord and it ends there. But there it connects to the second nerve, the spinothalamic nerve, which crosses to the other side and then heads up to the base of our brain. You see there in circle four that it ends in the thalamus. So the thalamus then connects this, uh, connects to the somatosensory cortex. And once the signal goes to our somatosensory cortex, 
that's when we actually feel, that's when we physically hurt, when we feel the pain. So keep that in mind. That's the important nerve uh, activation that makes us feel pain. And when we talk about treating pain, we're talking about blocking the activation or reducing the activation of those nerves so people don't hurt as much. And so historically, we've looked at addressing what's happening there in the foot. But now we know there's other things we can address along this entire pathway that will make a difference. And some of that is what occurs in the thalamus. So you'll see there in circle four, the thalamus not only sends the signal to the somatosensory cortex, but it sends signals to other areas of the brain as well. And this diagram for simplicity's sake just has it going to two areas, but it goes to many, many areas. Uh, one is the amygdala. So if, it's, if, if this injury was caused by something we're afraid of, our amygdala, which is our fear center, will we'll increase the signaling back to the thalamus and to the somatosensory cortex. So it'll have an effect on how we feel. Uh, if it's something that's happened before and we're not afraid of it, uh, then it'll turn that signal down. Uh, it'll also, the thalamus also sends a signal to the uh, hippocampus, which is responsible for memory recall. And again, if it's something we remember was a real problem before, it turns out the signal, so we'll pay attention to it more and we feel more pain. If it's something we remember was no big deal, it'll turn down that signal because we don't need to pay attention to it if it's no big deal. Uh, other areas it goes to uh, will have same effects. They, they modulate that final signal to the somatosensory cortex. So to give you kind of a, a visual understanding of how this works, our brain is really this fantastic organ and, and it does this modulation of all sensory uh, input so that it makes sense to us. So this is how it does it for vision. So as you look at this picture, I will tell you that square A and square B are the exact same shade of gray. But as hard as you look at that, you can't make square B look like square A. And that's because your brain is changing the input to your occipital cortex because if they look the same, the whole picture would look chaotic. It would, I can't imagine what that would look like if those colors looked the same to us. To make sense, the square B is supposed to be a light square. So it changes the input to our occipital cortex so that it makes sense. Uh, and, and, and that's considering all of the surrounding figures, the checkerboard, the cylinder, the shadow that's being cast. As I start to take away some of those things that are affecting uh, how we view it, you'll see the colors look closer and closer to being the same. Until so finally at the end, they are indeed the same color. And this is a cutout from the very first picture to show you that, yes, indeed, uh, those were the same colors. Uh, but again, our brain was changing that. And, and the scientists call that lightness constancy. But our brain does that again with all sensory input. That's why you can stand in a crowded room and there's people talking all around you, but you can pay attention to the person in front of you and you can hear what they say because your brain filters out some of that other stuff that's going on. So it does it for pain as well. And, and as it does that, as you see for acute pain, the tissue input and usually is the major aspect of the pain that we feel, but our thoughts and our emotions have some impact on that uh, and they modulate how we feel that pain. And that's the way pain is supposed to work. For chronic pain, the system is very different and our thoughts and our emotions become the major drivers of the pain and the tissue input becomes much less. In fact, in some conditions of chronic pain, there is no tissue input. Uh, fibromyalgia is one of those. There is no tissue input in fibromyalgia. It's entirely driven by thoughts and emotions. Many people with chronic nonspecific low back pain, there is no longer a problem with their back. That signal is not originating from the tissue damage. It's original, originating from activation of those nociceptive uh, nerves and from other nerves along that process, taking it to the brain. That again is being driven by thoughts and our emotions. So we can do all the back surgery or, or, or uh, interventions that we want on their back and they'll have some improvement for a while, likely secondary to the placebo effect. But after several months, their pain gets back to where it was again. So we need to be uh, addressing the other things that are controlling it, that are addressing, that are causing that pain. So quickly, let me share with you three mechanisms of pain. No susceptive pain. So there's two types of pain, acute and chronic. They're different. They have different uh, processes. But there's three mechanisms that make us feel pain up here in our somatosensory cortex. No susceptive pain is the way pain is supposed to work. No see means pain. Septive means receive. So we've received the signal that something's happening. Uh, 
It's the case in most acute pain. We understand nociceptive pain. That's kind of how we were taught pain works. Neuropathic pain is when there's damage to that nerve system, to that uh, the, the nerve pathway. And where that damage is occurring, it's sending a signal that's going to our brain and it makes us hurt because it's activating the somatosensory cortex. But it makes us hurt where that system should have started or where it used to start, uh, which would be in most cases in our foot or our lower leg. So think of diabetic neuropathy or think of a herniated disc, right? With a herniated disc, the problem's in your back, but you feel the pain in your foot. So we, we understand that. We've been taught about that. We kind of understand neuropathic pain as well. The third type of pain is very important, and, and, and this is what I want you to understand, and that's a relatively newer term called nociplastic pain. Noci means pain. Plastic means change. This pain has occurred because our nervous system has changed in a way that magnifies the nerve uh, signal to the brain or that even causes it in the first place. And, and the, the way we that we mostly see this in our patients is central sensitization. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that after the break. Um, central sensitization is where people feel more pain and in many cases they have pain when they shouldn't. Again, think of fibromyalgia, think of chronic nonspecific low back pain. Somatic symptom disorder, that's a psychiatric disorder, but uh, it's classified as that, but it's where people are having pain that we can't identify a source. It's the same thing that's happening. Something is happening those, that's causing that signal to get to the brain and people have real pain, but we can't find the cause because there's not a good way to diagnose this nociplastic pain. There's others as well, including opioid withdrawal. With opioid withdrawal pain, you feel pain when people are trying to come off of their opioids or when they run out early at the end of the month. That pain occurs in areas where they've had pain before. So if they're taking opioids for their chronic low back pain, their low back pain gets worse. They interpret that to mean that their back is worse when in fact it's part of this nociplastic change that's occurred to their central nervous system. So as, as we think about it, nociceptive pain is the way pain is supposed to work. Neuropathic pain is damage to the nervous system. Nociplastic pain is changes to the nervous system. And that's important because we need to work with them to change that back to normal. And there's some things that we can do to that. And we're gonna share that in the second part of this talk. And then there's opioid withdrawal pain. I think that's very important. We see that more than we think. Our patients on chronic opioids or our patients who are buying them on the street, uh, when they try to come off, they're having at reactivation of these pain memories and they feel real physical pain. So these are three central sensitization syndromes, fibromyalgia, chronic headaches, irritable bowel syndrome, chronic neck pain, chronic back pain, interstitial cystitis. These are all of the chronic pain syndromes that we've had a difficult time getting control of in our patients. And in fact, to some degree, all chronic pain, because the longer pain goes on, the more we get depressed, the more we get ang anxious, and the more that causes some of these changes to occur in our brain, that again, makes us have more pain and kind of gets us in this downward cycle. So this is kind of a, a slide that really shows the relationship of these, and I'll come back to this later uh, in the talk but it shows how our thoughts and our emotions have a positive and negative effect on each other. Our thoughts and our emotions can have a positive or negative effect on our pain, as I talked about, but notice pain always has a negative effect on our thoughts and our emotions, which shows us one reason why it's important to treat acute pain effectively and quickly uh, to get people out of it. It also shows us why studies have shown that people who have an acute injury and have acute pain their risk of developing chronic pain is not related to the severity of their injury. It's related to their emotional and cognitive state at the time of their injury more than anything else. Um, so we'll come back to that in a little bit as well. So it's a little bit past 12.15. I'm gonna stop here. We're gonna take an hour break. Uh, we'll start back afterwards. We'll have just kind of a brief thing on opioids and then we'll talk about uh, how we manage pain and some of the newer techniques that we're using. So thank you. See you all back in an hour. Don mentioned, we will be, um, feels like every time I raise my voice because the mic isn't on, it starts coming on. Um, but um, we'll be back here at 1.15, um, try to be on time because I know that he has his presentation timed out pretty well. Um, but food is going to be in the same spot where breakfast was. If you weren't here for breakfast, it's just down the hall, follow the crowd of the people who do know where it is.
want to say that um, you get lucky. Um, I only had I only had the morning to moderate, so you get a new moderator for the afternoon, so you don't have to put up with me anymore. Good afternoon. I think you can all hear me now. And welcome to the second half of today's program, the update in primary care. I'm Dr. Paul McKinney. I'm a professor of medicine and public health at UofL, and I'm pleased to have been a co-director of this program for most of the past 26 years. Um, the second half of the program will lead off today with the continuation of the Robert H. Couch MD Memorial Lecture uh, part two is a continuation of updates in acute and chronic pain management by Dr. Donald Teeter. Um, it's especially important after his presentation today for any questions that you do step to the microphone uh, and ask the questions so that Dr. Teeter, who is remote today, can hear and respond appropriately. Thank you. So please do welcome back Dr. Don Teeter, a pain and addiction specialist with the Southeast Alaska Regional Health Consortium and owner of the Teeter Health Solutions. Dr. Teeter. All right, thank you very much. I hope everybody enjoy their lunch and are not too drowsy for the second part of this. We'll start briefly talking about opioids. Um, you know, we all learned that uh, they cause respiratory depression if you give too much and we need to be careful with that. Uh, in fact, there's a lot of issues with opioids um, and I'll just share a few of them to kind of get us started here in the second half. Uh, this is a study came out a few years ago, but was just cited uh, by the CDC. It's one of their studies they cited as they're doing their update to the CDC pain guidelines. Uh, and this was a two-year perspective cohort study uh, at a, a series of pain centers throughout Portugal. Uh, and they looked at a total of 529 people. And uh, this, again, this is, these were chronic pain clinics. And uh, about 60% of them were put on opioids at baseline, but that increased to about 70% after two years. And many of them were for strong opioids. And what they found was that after two years time, the opioid users reported no improvement in pain symptoms, physical function, emotional function, or social and family disability. So, you know, we've been putting a lot of people on opioid pain medications for chronic pain. <coughs> Excuse me without evidence that they help long-term. Long in fact, the studies we've, we do have show that they probably don't. Uh, a lot of the long-term use has been based on studies that lasted only about a month. Uh, and in those studies, they showed that pain improvement was about 10 to 12%. Most people don't notice pain improvement if it's less than 20% improvement. So uh, the improvement is very little. So why do people like these medications so much and why do we give so much? And it's actually because of the calming effect that they have that I mentioned earlier and they help people relax a little bit. And many people with chronic pain end up developing a lot of anxiety, a lot of depression. Uh, and they work for that temporarily, but as time goes on, they actually reverse that. So um, opioids really are, are a, a treatment that, that we've used that has really no evidence of, of success and and the evidence we have shows that it doesn't work and probably causes more side effects. So there's a number of problems with opioids used long-term. And, and you may know some of these, obviously there's the respiratory depression, I won't even mention that, but they are mentally impairing. Our patients on chronic opioid therapy should not be driving a car. They shouldn't be working in safety sensitive positions at work. Um, they will struggle in school uh, or in any kind of uh, work that uh, requires some thinking. Also very important in the elderly, um, one of the, Biggest, most frequent causes of delirium or confusion in the adult and the elderly is opioids. Uh, they delay recovery from surgery or for injuries. They increase medical costs. They lead to opioid hyperalgesia. And so, you know, most of us have heard of this, but we don't really know that much about it. Opioid hyperalgesia occurs because the brain is trying to reverse the effects of the opioid. So, again, we, we feel pain because it's supposed to be helpful for us. And if we, if we take ibuprofen, uh, it works, 
or other NSAIDs, it works at the area of the injury. Say we have a sprained wrist. It'll work by decreasing the inflammation in the wrist and we feel less pain. But the opioids working in the brain, our brain is smart enough and knows something's happening and we should be feeling that pain. So it begins to make changes after the first dose. Uh, and these changes are such that uh, as the opioid wears off, we feel more pain. Now, after one dose, uh, it's measurable. Actually, we've been able to measure that, but it's probably imperceivable by the patient. After three or four doses, probably still, but after being on it for a week, it probably is noticeable. Um, now, hopefully with most acute pain treatment, their tissue is healing up and their pain is getting better anyway, so they're able to stop it. But with chronic pain uh, treatment, uh, it makes it so that they feel their pain more uh, significantly and it makes it worse. And they get this, some of this opioid withdrawal pain as they try to come off of it. We think opioid hyperalgesia occurs basically with every opioid except for buprenorphine and maybe methadone, um, but all the other opioids lead to opioid hyperalgesia. This study that I cite here showed that if you have an injury at work and you receive an opioid within the first six weeks of that injury, uh, an opioid prescription for seven days or more, it doubles your risk of being disabled one year later. All other things being equal, including the severity of the injury, uh, that prescription doubles your risk. Increases the risk of falls and fractures. Now, this study that I cite here was done in, in a Medicare population, uh, but it's been shown to happen even in children. Uh, at least it increases their risk of falls. They're not as likely to have a fracture when that happens. But clearly, this is a significant thing in the elderly. They are four times more likely to fall or to suffer a fracture while on opioids. They do have cardiac effects. They increase your risk of having an MI about three times compared to those who are not on opioids. That's a higher incidence of MI than people that were on Vioxx or Bextra, which were both taken off the market because of their cardiac effect. So uh, this is a significant thing as well. They cause GI bleeding similar to the non-selective NSAIDs, but more than the coccybs. So these are the two points I want you to really remember. They are very calming. Uh, and this is uh, for people with chronic anxiety. Uh, this is a really significant thing for them. Um, whether the anxiety is from their pain or whether they had underlying anxiety before that, they take that first opioid pill and it calms them down as good or better than a benzodiazepine. Um, and not only do they feel calm, but they have some additional feelings which make it even more addicting than, than benzodiazepines. Like they feel content, they feel motivated, they feel confident in themselves. So it's kind of interesting what they do. But that calming uh, wears off as the pill wears off and they take another pill and ultimately as they develop tolerance, their anxiety increases to where it gets to the point where after about a month of being on them, their anxiety while they're taking the medication is about the same as their anxiety was before they started. But when they try to stop, it gets much, much worse. So that's one of the reasons it makes it very hard for some people to come off of opioids is because of this uh, behavioral calming effect that it has. This one is the other reason. They, uh, uh, opioids are miracle drugs for treating depression, but it's a very short-term effect. It doesn't last very long. Many of our patients have, have had chronic depression all their lives, and they've, um, you know, taken uh, Prozac, Cymbalta, Effexor, all that kind of stuff, and they all help a little bit, but nothing's really a miracle reducing the depression. We give them an opioid pill, and within 15 minutes, their, their depression goes away. And so that is extremely reinforcing for them. But like the calming effects, as time goes on, that becomes uh, less significant. And after they've been on it for one month, their depression becomes worse than it was before they started on the opioid. And when they try to stop the opioid, their depression gets worse yet. So again, it makes it even harder to stop that opioid after they've been on it for a while. <coughs> Excuse me again. As we know, diversion is an issue. We don't really know how much that happens, but it, you know, if any of these figures are right, it is uh, very significant. Uh, opioids and benzodiazepines are the only drugs we prescribe that have a, a negative effect on people other than who we're prescribing it to. This study showed that if we give a prescription to an individual, it triples the risk that a family member will overdose in the next year. This study showed that opioids cause brain changes that can be um, measured or can be seen on an MRI after taking opioids for one month. Uh, when they did the study, they immediately stopped the opioids after one month. They did the MRI six months later and brain changes were still there. And their conclusion was that uh, opioids cause brain changes that are permanent. And as we know, they can lead to addiction. 
So all of these are significant problems with opioids. And so you wonder why we would use them uh, for an indication like chronic pain when we've got no evidence of, of long-term benefit. In fact, the evidence we have shows there is no long-term be benefit. So this shows why opioids in people with central sensitization or nociplastic pain, that pain that is mostly driven by thoughts and emotions and has very little tissue input, why they are very dangerous in these people because most of their pain is being driven by their negative thoughts and their negative emotions. We give them an opioid immediately, it reverses that and their pain gets dramatically better. So they feel so much better, but not only that, but now they're happy when they were sad before. Uh, and now, you know, they're having positive thoughts and negative thoughts. Their family likes being around them better. But again, as that effect wears off over the next two weeks or the next month, their thoughts and emotions get worse, which then makes their pain worse. Uh, and, and so, again, that's why we see many of these people that have been on opioids a long time and their pain is no better than when it started and maybe worse, but it makes it really hard to stop it because as we try to stop their pain gets worse uh, yet. And they just think they cannot come off of it. But I will tell you that my patients that I try to taper off, and, and I see a lot of folks that are on higher dose of opioids and we try to taper them off, um, they have a lot of physical effects from that. They have more pain. Uh, they have um, a lot of restlessness. They have GI symptoms. They have a lot of stuff that goes on. But the thing that bothers them most is the anxiety that's associated with that, with those withdrawal symptoms. They oftentimes feel they're going to die, even if we take the taper really slow. So that's something that really has to be addressed and you have to consider. And they have to be warned about ahead of time. So I just briefly want to talk about addiction uh, from opioids. This study was done by the CDC a few years ago, and it showed that it, it looked at people that had been on opioids um, for a uh, short term. These are people that had not been on opioids before. They got an acute prescription, and they looked at, at uh, risk factors from that initial prescription that led to ongoing opioid use. And what they found was the duration of opioid prescribing for that acute prescription, for that acute pain problem, was directly related to how long they remained on opioids. So if they got a one-day prescription, they had a 6% chance of still being on an opioid one year later. If they got an eight-day prescription, that doubled the risk to 13%. And if they got a 31-day prescription, that increased their risk to one out of three, being on it long-term. You see the three-year probability is about half of that. I believe that most of those people that, uh, that were not still on them in three years were probably taken off by their provider. And then many of them maybe got on them from buying them on the street. So our acute prescribing of opioids are really problematic. All of the opioids prescribed tramadol was the worst. Tramadol, people that got a tramadol prescription was, were twice as likely to develop long-term use problems. Tramadol is the opioid that has, that um, uh, of all the people across the, the entire world that are addicted to opioids, tramadol is most common addiction. Uh, tramadol is also not very effective for pain. So I recommend against using it for acute pain. These are, Total of 11 uh, studies, 10 other studies actually that showed that uh, acute use of opioids ends up with long-term problems. And that's either measured by ongoing use or by future prescriptions or by uh, addiction symptoms uh, or encounters for addiction uh, related problems. Uh, all of them showed this risk was between five and 7%. So using opioids for short-term use is, has significant risk because, because I tell you, these people changed their life completely. And this, many of these studies also with the people that didn't get opioids and their risk is about 0.7%. So given that opioid prescription is really dramatic and in increasing their risk. So what do we do? How do we treat pain? So obviously I think opioids are not good. We need to avoid them when we can. Uh, these studies are looking at post-op pain. Uh, most of them are either after wisdom tooth removal. So these are younger people um, that get an opioid, that got an opioid prescription, uh, or it looks at bunionectomy, which is obviously an older population. Both of them painful surgeries. They look at how much the various drugs reduce pain and they consider 50% pain relief, successful pain relief. So that's the goal. If, if we reduce pain 50%, most people are happy with that. If we reduce it 30%, people notice that they're better, but they're not happy with that. So our goal is 50% pain relief uh, after an acute injury or surgery. And, and these are all post-surgical studies. So these people are in the uh, recovery room. They give them either the medication or the placebo. They ask them one to two hours later what their pain is. If it's dropped by 50%, then that's a positive result. So 200 milligrams of ibuprofen and over one third of people said their pain reduced by 50%. I thought that was a pretty good result. 
One extra strength Tylenol, 500 milligrams uh, acetaminophen, about one fourth of people. I also thought that was pretty good after these procedures. Doubling the ibuprofen doesn't make it much better. Looking at oxycodone, 15 milligrams given after this, these procedures, and it's less effective than one extra strength Tylenol. Only 21% of people had adequate pain relief. Now they might've been calmer if they were anxious, uh, but as far as the, the physical pain goes, the sensory aspect of their pain, it only reduced to 21%. The combination of oxycodone and acetaminophen, this next one is roughly two, per, two five milligram Percocet pills with a little extra acetaminophen, no better than one, no better than one over-the-counter ibuprofen. So using the combination of ibuprofen and acetaminophen together, 200 milligrams of ibuprofen and 500 of acetaminophen, and you get much better results than any of those other medi medications. So this is what I recommend to my patients that I have an addiction treatment when I don't want them taking opioids. In fact, basically all patients I come on, uh, in contact with, I recommend this because it's safer. It has a side effect profile of placebo. Pain relief lasts between six and eight hours. Um, and uh, it, again, it's very safe and very effective. So this is what I recommend to my patient. And actually uh, in my program in Alaska, we've got pre-printed cards that have this recommendation on how they take these and when uh, for after uh, various injuries or procedures. This is a study that I wanna highlight that came out from a collaboration between the American College of Physicians, internists, and the American Academy of Family Physicians. So they got together to look at non-pharmacologic and pharmacologic management of acute pain from non-low back musculoskeletal injuries. Um, and, and so they put a lot of effort into it. They, they came out with this in, at the end of 2020. It didn't get much coverage. I don't think either organization really published much about it. Uh, it was obviously in the annals of internal medicine, but a lot of people haven't heard about this. So again, this was a, a big research effort. It involved a total of 207 studies with 32,000 adult patients. And they had a mixture of musculoskeletal injuries. So these were not post-operative like the other ones were. These were injuries. Uh, many have more sprains, strains, uh, whiplash, uh, even fractures were involved. Uh, and the, the median pain at the start of the treatment was six and a half on a 10 centimeter uh, VAS scale. So that's pretty significant pain that these people had. And they came out with several conclusions. So one is that they recommend topical non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs with or without menthol gel. So that was their very first recommendation, their primary recommendation. We should be using topical agents instead of oral agents for these uh, injuries. So for, for strains, sprains, bruises, even fractures, if it's a closed fracture, topical uh, anti not non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs uh, are, are great. They're as good or better than the medication and the pills with less side effects. Their number two A recommendation was using NSAIDs and or oral acetaminophen. So that's the next option. That's what you do uh, uh, in, instead of the, uh, the topical or maybe in addition to the topical. 2B was equal to 2A. So that's why they gave them both an equal uh, setting. And this was to use acupressure or TENS units for acute pain. Now, I don't know if any of us were taught about how to do that or have learned since this came out, but this is really something we need to look into more. And recommendation three was we recommend you against using opioids for acute non-low back musculoskeletal injuries, including tramadol. So again, we need to get away from using opioids for acute pain. And so my contention is based on this and the previous um, Cochrane reviews that looked at post-op surgery, Outpatient treatment of pain should almost always be with non-opioids. Now, there might be some times when they can't take NSAIDs or acetaminophen for one reason or another, and maybe we do need to use them for very short term, but know that uh, even one day is a risk and more than one day has higher risk. So we got to use as few as possible. So this is a typical NSAID. This is um, uh, one you can buy over the counter, diclofenac sodium uh, topical gel. Uh, you know, it's been around for a while, it used to be prescription. Uh, now you can find it at almost any pharmacy or uh, many convenience stores or, you know, Walmart or some of those other uh, uh, box stores. Diclofenac sodium gel, I don't know if you've ever used it before. Uh, you ought to buy a tube if you haven't and read the instructions. You have to use quite a bit. So you have to put on a long line uh, of, of the gel if you're using it on a major joint or, uh, you know, major area. You have to use a lot of this stuff. It's a gel. It rubs in very easily. It evaporates very quickly and dries up. 
uh, it also has to be applied four times a day to be effective. So, you know, that affects uh, the compliance some, so you need to keep that in, in consideration, uh, but it does very well. Uh, it, it has similar effect, efficacy to oral NSAIDs, and it looks like it has a side effect profile of placebo. So really cool treatment. You need to be using more of this if you're not using it already. This is just a quick thing on acupressure. So this was doing acupressure on kids before they did venipuncture. And what they did was they did pressure to these points that have circled in red here. Um, and, and they did, they put pressure in these areas with their thumb for about 30 seconds each. And then they did the venipuncture. They pulled these kids before they did the, the venipuncture and asked what pain they thought they were gonna have. And they thought it was gonna be about four out of five, four point five out of 10. Uh, and that, that's in the acupressure group. But the other group that didn't get acupressure, the control group, they thought about the same thing. They expected it to be about four and a half out of 10. The pain experienced after the procedure dropped dramatically. It was you know, around two out of 10 for those who had the acupressure compared to, again, four and a half, almost five out of 10 for those who didn't get the acupressure. So pretty dramatic decrease. There's also been studies showing for hip fracture, acupressure applied out in the community by EMS providers before they take people to the hospital uh, decreases their pain by about 50%. So, you know, this is something that I used to kind of laugh at many years ago, but there's pretty significant studies showing that this is effective and we need to be looking into to, uh, to, uh, you know, knowing more about this and even offering it. So those are some things that are new in acute pain. Those are new guidelines from ACP and, and AAFP. I encourage you to look them up, read more about it. It's, it, it. You know, it was a good study. It was very comprehensive. As I said, it didn't get the publicity that it should have. I think it's very helpful. Uh, I still am not confident enough myself to use acupressure for my patients, but I do use a lot of the other stuff. So what's new with chronic pain treatment? Uh, we'll talk about that, as I mentioned before. Chronic pain is very, very different. Um, it's mostly driven by our thoughts and our emotions. These are our, our patients that have been difficult for us to manage, our chronic low back pain patients, because they've had multiple procedures and things done, multiple medications. None of that stuff works very good. So what do we do? Well, we need to work on those thoughts and emotions. So behavioral therapy really becomes the cornerstone of treatment. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy is the one that's been studied most uh, mindfulness has also been helpful. And by the way, CBT and mindfulness can also be helpful for acute pain for people that are going to have surgery. If we teach them some of these techniques ahead of time, they have less pain afterwards. But in particular, it's been shown for chronic pain. I'll share some studies with you in a few minutes. Um, the mindfulness, so CBT kind of changes how we think about pain, changes our thoughts about pain. Mindfulness really helps us recognize pain, but not react to it because it's our reaction that often makes it worse. Uh, there's others like uh, acceptance and commitment therapy has, has some evidence showing it works and so other um, behavioral techniques uh, that are promising. EMDR uh, may uh, have some role. There's some early evidence that shows it can be helpful. So we're learning a lot about this and there's a lot that can be done. And I'm gonna share a few recent studies in just a minute about this. I think for your patients with chronic pain, if they're gonna get better, if they're not involved with a behavioral therapist, in particular one who's had specific training in treating chronic pain, uh, your results or their results on rec pain recovery uh, is gonna be limited. Uh, adding in the behavioral therapist really expands what we can do. Uh, and makes, it, makes us much more likely that we're gonna have over 50% reduction in their pain. Physical therapy and occupational therapy are important. So this is for several reasons, but people with chronic pain, they have developed this, um, this uh, mental connection between certain movements and the pain that they can expect to have, right? So they know that bending down to the floor is gonna hurt their back. So it, it begins to work much like uh, what we saw in the experiment with Pavlov's dog, right? You remember that? Uh, he would present the dog with food and he'd measure, he had a, a conductor that measured the amount of saliva the dog generated. And when it saw and smelled the food, it started to generate saliva, preparing to be ready to eat it. So he did that for a little bit, but then he started ringing a bell first and then giving the dog the food later. And after doing that long enough, the dog's subconscious began to associate ringing the bell with the food. And so the saliva started coming when you first rang the bell. Where our brains do that with pain as well. Our brains begin to realize, well, bending down is going to hurt your back. 
So even as you start to bend down, uh, your back starts to hurt because your brain is sending that pain signal to your, uh, or your, your central nervous system is sending that pain signal to your somatosensory cortex because it wants to warn you before you do it. So you start to have pain even before you really start to do the, the movement that's a problem. And so there's all these associated thoughts with our movements. And so PT and OT can help us gradually start doing those movements, get more active, start using those muscles, and they really extinguish that memory. So you begin to learn that you can do these, uh, these uh, movements without pain, and it helps your pain start to get better. There's some other things they can do. One's called pain neuroscience education. I'm going to talk about that in a minute that even improves their efficacy at reducing pain. But your, your PT and OT folks need to be your other friends. So there's a lot of things we can do and a lot of people that need to be involved. But in particular, when you're treating people with chronic pain, you need to have relationships with behavioral therapy and PT and OT uh, so that they can be your, on your team as far as treating chronic pain with your patients. Treatment of mood disorders is, is obviously important because people that are depressed have more pain and because having chronic pain causes depression. So as we treat their mood disorders and they're feeling better, it actually makes them feel less pain. So that's an important thing that we need to do. Exercise is important for everybody. Um, and, and the key is, is you don't want them to go out and overdo it because then they associate exercise with pain. You wanna kind of have them gradually increase what they're doing. It might just be walking out to the mailbox that's you know 15 feet in front of their, their front door and then back again uh, once a day and then twice a day and then you know, gradually increase that as they can do more and more, kind of find out what their limits are and keep it a little shorter than that. Exercise helps everybody. A study recently even showed that people with severe osteoarthritis of the knees, walking on a regular uh, basis makes them feel less pain. So we need to get them to do it, even though it hurts sometimes, but not to the point where it hurts and disables them. Distraction is also very important. So the less we are thinking about our pain, the less we notice it and the less it hurts. Um, and, and so this can be really important. So the last thing you want your patient doing is sitting around home thinking about their pain, which is what most of our patients are doing. So you want them to get out more. You want them to do other things. You want them to get together with friends. You want them to work on getting back to church, uh, to doing some fun things. Uh, all of these things not only take their mind off the pain, but begins to change some of those neural pathways, some of those nociplastic changes in their brain. Um, it begins to change them back to normal so they start to feel less pain. Virtual reality is a great thing for this. So if it's a younger uh, individual who might enjoy that, have them get some virtual reality goggles and play some games. Uh, you can get on those things and you can take trips to other countries and see these wonderful things in other countries. So distraction can be very important. Acupuncture, acupressure, yoga, tai chi, other alternative therapies, are, can also be very important. There is evidence that shows that these can be helpful. Um, you know, once we make referral to acupuncture, that's kind of getting outside of our medical system oftentimes. So we kind of lose, uh, not necessarily control, but, but contact with what's going on there. But still, it's something we need to do. Uh, yoga can be helpful if they have back pain. Maybe they can do chair yoga. So some of this is helpful just because on its own, it works. But some of it is helpful also because now it's getting the patient more active in their own treatment. So part of what I tell patients with my first pain consult, my first visit with them, is I help them understand that if they're coming to me for them, for me to give them something to make them better, they're not going to get much better. That this involves a whole change in thinking that they need to be really the active person in their treatment. They will be the most important person in their treatment. Their behavior and their response to our recommendations will be the biggest driver in their outcomes. And we're going to work with them on those things. Um, and and this, these are some of the things that help them kind of get outside of the regular system and to be doing more on their own. Amitriptyline, duloxetine, and gabapentin, all those help a little bit and they can be part of a comprehensive pain management program, but they can't be the cornerstone of treatment. None of them increase pain or none of them reduce pain more than 20%. And I think I mentioned before, 20% pain reduction is enough that you'll barely notice it. So again, they can be a part, maybe all of these, maybe some of these, um, but uh, they can't be the only thing we do or else patients won't be satisfied with their pain care. And that's what we've seen uh, with a lot of our pain patients in the past where this is all we've done. We've switched around with different medications um, and you know they're maybe a little bit better, but not dramatically better. The answer is really not in the pills. 
Some procedures may reduce pain. So I'm not anti-procedure, certainly with acute disc herniation in their back where they're having back pain and they're having radiation of pain under their leg, um, epidural steroid injections, uh, even surgery might reduce that leg pain. It might not improve the back pain actually, but it might help the leg pain. Uh, so that can be helpful. With chronic pain that's been going on so uh, for a long time, those aren't nearly as effective. In fact, Cochrane Reviews looking at um, doing spinal fusion for spinal stenosis says that the evidence just isn't there that this is effective and yet it's done all the time on our, on our patients. And they tend to get better for a while, but then they get worse again. Um, but there is some roles, radiofrequency nerve ablation, it temporarily can reduce back pain. Uh, it's not a miracle. Typically, re relief is three to six months, but it does give people some relief for a little while while they can start the rest of this program. So there is some role of these things, but they're seldom the, the cornerstone. Um, um, spinal cord stimulators, you know, studies have shown on average about 30% improvement with those. So again, if we're counting on just that, it's not going to do it. We need to be doing other stuff as well. So going back to the behavioral treatment, this was a, a, a meta-analysis done a few years ago looking at several studies, looking at um, back pain and, and treatment with CBT techniques and mindfulness techniques and how well they help. And it showed that compared to usual care, people that, that learned mindfulness and use it or they got CBT for pain, uh, about, they're about twice as likely to have marked improvement in their back pain. So that's pretty significant for our chronic back pain patients. So we need to be thinking about that. Other studies have shown that oftentimes this doesn't last. It tends to wear off because we get back in our old habits. I'll talk a little bit more about CBT in a minute. Uh, but CBT changes your thinking about pain, but we tend to get lazy and get back into our old habits and get back to our old thinking and their pain starts to return. So CBT often has to be kind of an ongoing thing. So we've had data on CBT for pain. Um, which is a kind of a cool thing, you know? You remember the diagram I showed earlier, and I think I have it coming up here again in a minute, where pain is kind of a relationship between our thoughts and our emotions and, and the sensory aspect. Well, it's hard to change your emotion, and it's hard to just change the sensory input, but we are able to change our thoughts, and that's really what cognitive behavioral therapy focuses on. It changes your thinking about the pain, because as time goes on and we get more negative, we start to have these negative thoughts, these automatic negative thoughts, we begin to catastrophize, all of that makes your pain worse. And we can change that and help that help that thinking change. So there's been several studies in the last year that have looked at special programs that really work on focusing on how people think about their pain. And uh, the most recent one was this one by Dr. Donino that came out of uh, Beth, uh, Beth Deaconess at Israel Deaconess Hospital in, uh, in Boston. And so this was kind of intensive. This was a 12 week course, three hours each week. The first four weeks really talked about pain education, which is important. As people learn more about their pain, they get less afraid of it. Talked about desensitization and emotional expression. And then the last eight weeks uh, really focused on really mindfulness meditation where it helps them detach from their, their pain, rea their reaction to their pain symptoms. And so this wasn't a big study. They had 35 patients. 11 of them got this physio, uh, psychophysiologic symptom relief therapy. 12 got just plain uh, mindfulness meditation. MBSR is mindfulness-based stress reduction. And 12 got usual care, which was, you know, uh, anti-inflammatories and exercise recommendations. Caveat on all these studies I'm going to show you is participants had to be willing to consider a mind-body intervention. That's what they said in this study. A lot of our patients don't want to do that. If we tell them that they can see a behavioral therapist to help their pain, they think we're saying, oh, you're saying it's all in my mind. Well, it's not. So, you know, we need to kind of learn how to talk with them to help them to know that, that our behavioral therapists now have some tricks they can do that can help us turn off that pain signal. So this is the results from this. People that got the PSRT treatment, um, it looked at the percent of patients with complete functional re recovery. So these are people that are with chronic back pain that have been limited for a long time. And after eight weeks of this treatment, you know, about three fourths of them had complete functional recovery. They were almost back to normal. Now, again, over time, that kind of drops down and probably as time went on, that would go back to normal. But it just goes to show how this treatment can have a dramatic improvement in our function and even in our pain. This showed the percentage that had complete pain relief. And notice at the end of treatment, over 50% of back patients had, were completely pain-free just by doing this treatment. 
So again, you, you think of your chronic back pain patients and how much success we've had in treating them with medications and even just physical therapy. And now we're seeing these dramatic responses with some of these behavioral health techniques. Uh, these will be some of the treatments in the future. Empowered Relief is another study that was done. So this one was done out of uh, Stanford by Beth Darnall. And this is simply a single session, two hour pain class. So this is not behavioral therapy. This is just psychoeducation, teaching people about pain, what pain is, how they can do mindfulness themselves, how they can do certain CBT skills at home themselves. And it's just one single two hour class. So this is something that's easy to do. It can actually be done by non-clinicians. So in my organization in, in Alaska, we have an LPN who got the training on how to do this. And she does that for our people uh, in, in Alaska. So it can be basically anybody. You don't have to be a therapist. You don't have to be a healthcare professional. But you do this two hour class, people sit through the class. Uh, you know, they ask them some questions, but it's not really a behavioral health technique, uh, but it changes their thinking about their pain. And so this had a few more patients, uh, 263 patients, again, equally divided between those that got empowered relief, those that got the typical cognitive behavioral therapy for pain that we saw before was effective, and those that just got health education about low back pain. And so one of the things they found was that pain catastrophizing decreased dramatically, more than with just health education, but similar to CBT. And that's one of the goals in CBT is to help reduce pain catastrophizing because that reduces pain. Pain interference also decreased similar to CBT's technique. So basically this showed that the way people think about their pain, it was similar to having a, a prolonged CBT training for, by a CBT therapist, which can be eight weeks or more. This two hour class was effective in doing that and it's easy to do. Pain only decreased by one point, but they're, they're catastrophizing less and they have less interference in their life from CBT, from uh, the pain. So again, something significantly effective in our chronic pain patients. The final study that came out recently, and that was just, just this year, is one called one on pain reprocessing therapy. And this was done in Boulder, Colorado, at, at University of Colorado. And, and, you know, I live in Denver, so this is right nearby. Uh, and they looked at 151 individuals with chronic low back pain, chronic nonspecific low back pain. And again, these people, the thought is the great majority of their pain is this nociplastic or, or central sensitization type pain. So 50 of these people got pain reprocessing therapy, which is a series of, of, of meetings with a behavioral therapist, kind of a structured set with a behavioral therapist. 51% got placebo uh, subcutaneous saline uh, injections. So they actually had a class on how placebo helps a lot of people. And then they got an injection of saline saying, this is a placebo injection. We, we think this might help you. And then 50% got, or 50 of them just got usual care, where again, we give them an exercise program and insets. Um, and so what they found, these are some of the results. So on the left is pain intensity. So plus, uh, placebo and usual care, about the same. So our usual care, as you see, isn't doing much. It drops pain about a point. Um, placebo does also. But the PRT was much more uh, impressive in how much it dropped pain intensity. You see uh, a next one, kind of a grouping of how much pain intensity grew, uh, dropped. And basically in the PRT group, everybody had uh, improvement except for one person where it stayed the same. Whereas in the other groups, the number of people got worse uh, and, and obviously it was less effective. And the percent of patients reporting pain-free or nearly pain-free after treatment was dramatically more in the people that got this pain reprocessing therapy by a therapist than our usual treatment. And, it, and the effects, you know, again, they start to wear off after a year, but still pretty significant where, you know, half of the patients are saying they're either pain-free or nearly pain-free. We've got no other treatments that do this. Um, so this is one of the newer things. You'll be hearing more about this. Uh, if your therapist you work with don't know pain reprocessing therapy, or if you don't have someplace that does empowered relief or, or the other uh, pain treatment, uh, you need to, work with your therapist to get them trained in these, in these programs. Now, I will say there's some caveats in the pain reprocessing therapy in the Boulder back study. So first of all, this was done in Boulder, Colorado, which is where the University of Colorado is. It's a university town. Essentially, everybody was highly educated. Everybody is upper middle class. It's an expensive place to live. You don't live there if you're working a minimum wage job. You have to live outside of town and you commute into town. So these are upper middle class, highly educated people. Uh, and I would bet that a lot of the folks we're seeing uh, don't fit into that category. 
They also all had chronic low back pain. So this is work for fibromyalgia, you know, probably because it's a similar pain um, mechanism with the nociplastic pain, um, but we don't know that for sure. They also didn't have really horrible pain. They had baseline pain that was only four out of 10. So these are people that are probably still working, still doing their daily stuff. They're just bothered by their pain. These are not the people that are in bed all day long and are saying their pain is 12 out of 10. And, and so again, maybe not the regular people we're seeing in, in our office. Um, so can this be, can this work for those folks? You know, we don't know. And in our experience at search is it works better on those people that are highly educated, highly motivated, regardless of their pain, uh, and even people with pretty severe pain, but, but you know, they need to be kind of smart because uh, it's kind of a, 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 an intense therapy. All of them also volunteered to receive behavioral therapy for treatment of their pain. And again, a lot of our patients won't do that. So just keep that in mind. But this uh, diagram here really goes back to um, understanding, again, that relationship and how these behavioral health techniques are working on that right upper quadrant, quad changing how we think about the pain. And that in itself will decrease how much pain we feel, but it also helps us have more positive emotions, less depression, that also helps us feel better uh, and also gives us an improved quality of life. So I think these behavioral techniques and more, there's gonna be more we're gonna be reading about uh, are gonna be some of the cornerstones. They probably already are the cornerstone of our treatment. I know they are for, our, for us at Search in Alaska. Um, you, again, you need, your job will need to be to find people that do that. And if you can't find people, um, then you need to get them um, um, trained to do it. And it's pretty easy to search online and find where they can get the training and how it can be done. It's pretty easy to get the training. The PRT training can be done over a weekend. Um, the empowered relief uh, training is, is, I think, two days, uh, two half days maybe. Um, so it's pretty easy to be done. So what we're doing at Search is for a lot of our patients, we recommend this empowered relief, a two hour course that they go to, uh, you know, pretty much regardless of their educational status. Uh, it's pretty basic helping them understand that their pain is not necessarily related to damage, but it's more related to central nervous system changes. And that's what we're gonna work on. So we, we recommend that for many of our patients. Uh, for some of our folks, again, those that are highly motivated, those that are willing to acknowledge that behavioral health can help them uh, and those, maybe that are more highly educated or that we think can learn easier. Uh, we refer to PRT uh, and we might expand that as time goes on. We're still learning. Both of these programs are, you know, within the past year. So uh, we really, our, our program is highly adaptable and we make changes all the time, but that's really what we're doing now. Pain neuroscience education is an important part for all of our patients. Just learning some about their pain uh, helps them have less pain. Um, our physical therapists and occupational therapists can do this. I do this some with our first uh, visit. I start to do some pain neuroscience education uh, to help them learn more about their pain. Studies have shown, shown just learning about your pain actually reduces your pain. So that brings up this study uh, that was done fairly recently. Um, and this is looking at doing pain neuroscience education in association with PT and exercise uh, for people with chronic uh, uh, pain. And what this first graph shows is that pain intensity, uh, this is a meta-analysis of a number, number of studies, pain intensity uh, reduced dramatically uh, compared, and this was compared to usual care. So uh, again, this stuff really works. This showed uh, meta-analysis looking at short-term disability due to their pain. It showed that reduced dramatically compared to just doing exercise uh, and activity alone. So pain neuroscience education is something that you're, um, PTs and OTs should be learning. Again, they can go online and, re and find out where they can get training for this. Uh, there's a lot of places doing it now. It really enhances the, the treatment they give uh, and improves outcomes. So I also want to mention low-dose naltrexone as a medication. Uh, this is not necessarily newer, but it's getting more attention recently. Um, it's something that I have really just started using in the last year. So many of you know naltrexone as a uh, medication that we use for treating opioid use disorder, for, uh, for treating opioid use disorder and for treating alcohol use disorder. For treating alcohol use disorder, there's a pill form, 50 milligrams that they take every day. Uh, you know, it's not a great treatment, but it, it works some and it's worth a try. Um, naltrexone is an opioid receptor blocker and 
alcohol actually stimulates the opioid receptor a little bit. So it makes them have a little less reinforcement from when they do drink. So it works for some for alcohol use disorder. It works more for opioid use disorder by blocking the opioid receptor. Um, so that's kind of how you know it. That's how, you, how you've used it. Uh, typically, it comes in 50 milligrams by pill form or a much higher dose that we inject once a month. But we found that using low doses, like between 0.5 and 5 milligrams, so very low doses once a day, has a different effect on chronic pain. It seems to reduce um, inflammation in the nervous tissues, in the spinal cord, uh, in, in the, the nerves that come from the spinal cord, in the brain. It reduces some of the inflammation that is causing chronic pain. And so it can significantly reduce chronic pain in some people. So in particular, those with central sensitization or nociplastic pain. So again, are difficult to treat patients who have had fibromyalgia, chronic low back pain, chronic neck pain, uh, interstitial cystitis, um, IBS, those folks, I think all of them, it's worth trying this low dose naltrexone. So again, it reduces some of that inflammation. Um, some people have dramatic uh, response to it. Some people don't have much. Some people might just get some placebo effect. It is extremely safe though. There's no side effects. It does have to be compounded. The tests that have been done on this look at different doses, anywhere from 0.5 to 4.5. Some studies even gradually increase the dose from 0.5 up to 4.5. I have never understood the science or the reason for doing that. I usually just start my patients on the 4.5 dose. It has to be compounded. It doesn't come commercially available in this dose. So you have to find a compounding pharmacy that can do it. Um, and, and they can make up capsules for you that have 4.5 milligrams once a day, and then the patient takes it. The pharmacy we use for this in Alaska, they compound, of course, it costs the patient about $50 a month. Uh, oftentimes insurance won't cover it since it's not really a prescription. Um, but an alternative to this, if your patient can't afford it, is they can compound it themselves. They can dissolve a 50 milligram tablet in orange juice and you can go online and find out what those measurements are and how to do it. The tablet will dissolve in water or orange juice. It is kind of bitter tasting. So commonly we put it in, in orange juice and then they do like a teaspoon a day. So that can be done if cost is an issue. But again, it has essentially no side effects. I am using more and more of this. Uh, I like doing this. It's easy. You can even give it to people who are on chronic opioids. Not only may it reduce their... Um, their uh, inflammation that's driving some of their pain, but there's some thought it may reduce opioid-induced hyperalgesia. So if they've gotten on their opioids and they're now having more pain because of that, putting them on the low-dose naltrexone does not diminish the effect of the chronic opioids. It actually may make it so that they, they are more, more helpful. So as I mentioned, it works especially well for people with nociplastic pain. So think about those things. Uh, you know, basically, as we think about treating our patients with chronic pain, um, I, I, I think about our patients and they, they, their entire life is, 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 is living in this big blue bubble, basically, of their life. And, and that has their friends in it, their, their school or their work in it, uh, the things they enjoy doing, what they do in their off time, how well they sleep, all these things that affect, that affect us and how we are in our life and our world. It's a big boo bubble. And then something happens and they have pain. And initially it's a nuisance and it might limit some of the things they can do. Uh, but usually they're still involved in their life and it doesn't completely shut their life down. But as time goes on, they begin to. They become less active. They spend more time at home. They exercise more. They have less fun. They stop going to church. They stop going to family get togethers. They are spending more and more time in their chair watching TV and their life gets smaller and it gets smaller. By the time they see us, their pain is their entire life. They've got little else that, that, that you know, is enjoyable for them. Um, and they're coming to see you. And if we just give them a pill that isn't very effective anyway, no wonder we haven't been doing very good. So we need to work on expanding their life. And, and behavioral therapy does this. We can do this also. One of the first things I ask my patients at the very first visit when I first see them is, what do you do for fun? And usually it's nothing. I can't do anything for fun. So then the follow-up question is, what did you used to do for fun? What did you used to do? And they'll talk about, you know, they're fishing or they're hiking or camping or going to the park with the kids or whatever it is. And, you know, that becomes one of your goals that you're going to work on. The goal for them uh, is not total pain relief, but the goal is getting their life back. And you start to record those goals and you begin to work on them. And if it's fishing, maybe after they start feeling a little bit better, you have them say, you say, 
I want you to start, uh, you know, just put on a casting uh, bobber and, and go out in your backyard and, and just cast a little bit, just practice that and get used to kind of, you know, swinging your fishing rod again. And then a little bit later, maybe go out and, and fish for five or 10 minutes and then come back home and gradually increase that. And so gradually we're increasing the fun that they're having, increasing their life. They're thinking less about their pain and their pain starts to get better. So I did want to quickly mention some chronic pain guidelines. You know, the CDC guidelines came out in 2016. 2016. Um, I was able to be a part of that and was a part of the expert panel. I thought it was really cool doing that. I think they were done really well, despite the bad publicity they got from people that were uh, employed by the pharmaceutical industry. Um, but basically they said clinicians should consider opioid therapy only if expected benefits for both pain and function are anticipated to outweigh the risks to the patient. And if you think about that, again, we've got this evidence of so many risks to not just the patient, but to society for prescribing opioids. And yet we've got no evidence of benefit from them. So basically, you know, if you look at this and you go by this uh, before starting opioid therapy, you're not gonna start anybody on opioids. Um, the VA and Department of Defense uh, just recently updated their, their guidelines just within the past few months. And, you know, they say we recommend against initiation of opioid therapy for the management of chronic non-cancer pain. Basically, they've had a lot of experience with it. They see what happens. People get worse. Uh, you know, it destroys lives. It destroys families. Um, so think about this. CDC is updating their guidelines. They should be coming out. Uh, any time now, I think they said October a few months ago. So we're kind of looking for that. They had a proposal out earlier where people made comments. And based on looking at that proposal and what they're thinking, uh, the question is what's going to be different in the guidelines? Well, specifically, they don't mention any dose limits before, uh, now. So before they said you need to be cautious when you get the 50 uh, morphine milligram equivalents a day for your patients. And you probably should avoid going above 90 because there's just no evidence that that helps. And those people have bad outcomes. So insurance companies and other groups took those numbers, 50 and 90, and made it specific limits for providers as far as if your patients are above these, you need to get them down. And that wasn't why they were written. So they kind of had some unintended consequences. So they, they're taking out that specific thing. They're basically saying for patients already receiving higher doses, think about reducing dosages if you know, benefit uh, doesn't, out, uh, doesn't outweigh the risk. Uh, so it's going to be a little more vague with no specific numbers. The other thing is there's going to be more of an emphasis on how to taper people off of opioids. So we have not done well with that in the past. So again, after the guidelines came out, a lot of organizations said, okay, you got to start tapering your patients. There is no evidence on how to do that. Tapers were done too, too quickly. People had bad outcomes. They often resort, resorted to taking them off the street, buying them off the street. Many people overdosed. Many people had more pain. Uh, even people committed suicide. So now there's a much more, uh, much uh, better explanation of how to do, to do the taper and understanding that it could take years in some people and that we shouldn't do it too quickly. We need to keep people uh, engaged in treatment while we're doing it. It also says no longer that we should avoid prescribing benzos and opioids concurrently, but it says we should uh, use extreme caution. So again, they're trying to get away a little bit from some of the harder language and making, making it a little bit softer. How will it be the same? It'll probably still say that we should only do it if we expect benefits outweigh the risks. It's common sense. That's what we do for all treatments, for everything we give for our patients, for any condition. And again, understanding all the risks that are involved and the lack of benefit that's been proven, it should be pretty rare that we do that. Most of the rest of it will be pretty similar. I just want to point this out so that if you're learning to, to if you're wanting to learn more about doing tapers, this guideline was put out by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services a few years ago, uh, and it's adapted from one that they used in Oregon. It's really very good. This is actually just a picture that's comes from a four-page PDF document that you can easily find. Do a search for this online. Uh, and basically, it says, you know, if your people are already on opioids, if the risks are higher than the benefits they're getting, you know, if they're not having functional improvement, and they're on higher doses and and and, you know, occasionally the drug test is positive or they're still smoking, still drinking. You know, this talks about how you need to talk about tapering them off. Um, you know, if you think it's really helping them, then maybe leave it on, but keep watching them. But if you think that they, it's not helping them, then you need to probably taper them off. And, and if you start to taper them and they can't do it, um, then you really assess, do these people have opioid use disorder 
or do they just have chronic pain that's too bad and they don't really meet the criteria for opioid use disorder but can't come off their opioids. And really for both these people, you put them on buprenorphine. Buprenorphine is a special, is a special opioid. Um, I put a lot of my patients on buprenorphine. For a lot of them that are already on opioids, we switched to that. Studies have shown that switching to buprenorphine can reduce pain about 50% and then maybe taper them off later if, if, if they're open to that. So buprenorphine is really a special medication for both addiction and pain. It's the only opioid I use for chronic pain. Um, it is, first of all, very powerful. One milligram of sublingual buprenorphine that we use for addiction equals 30 milligrams of morphine by mouth. You don't develop tolerance to buprenorphine, so if we find a dose that helps them, they can stay on that forever. It has a ceiling effect on respiratory depression, so it's safe, but it does not have that ceiling effect for pain relief. It's a wonderful antidepressant compared to all other opioids that make depression worse. This one actually treats depression uh, because of its effect on the, uh, on the kappa opioid receptor. It's effective in neuropathic pain. It's the only one. It's not immunosuppressive. All the other ones are. Has a high affinity for the opioid receptor, so it gets on there and sticks on there. There's no hormonal effects. All of the other opioids affect the HPA axis and decrease testosterone levels. It's less impairing, does not affect the QT interval. It's safe in renal insufficiency or renal failure. It's easier to take people off of it if you want to do that. And people on stable doses don't feel high. It really is a, an amazing medication. Again, it has so many benefits. I think it's the only one we should use for chronic pain. Uh, so if you have someone with chronic pain, you're thinking about an opioid, start with buprenorphine. When are opioids definitely indicated following severe trauma? So in particular, life-threatening injuries or trauma that has severed a limb, um, there's a very high risk of PTSD. Opioids, because of their calming effect, actually decrease that risk of PTSD. So there is some benefit for a short period, three to five days or less if possible. End of life, I think everybody should get them. Again, that calming effect is very important. And treating opioid use disorder, uh, buprenorphine and methadone are way more efficacious and save lives uh, compared to uh, um, abstinence-based treatment. So those things are all good. As with everything, it's a risk-benefit thing. We need to consider that. We haven't done so well with that in the past. I urge you to think about that for all patients with pain, whether it's acute or chronic. And in summary, pain is really a complex problem. We need to think beyond the pills. That's kind of what's gotten us into trouble. So that's my contact information. Feel free to reach out. I'm happy to take questions for a few minutes. Okay, so I have a lot of patients with um, medicinal marijuana requests for their chronic pain. And I was curious uh, what your thoughts were. So, you know, regardless of what you'll hear from people, we don't have good research on that. And um, uh, real experts in the field tell us that uh, the studies that have been done that look at long-term pain relief are conflicting. A lot of those studies have actually been done by the marijuana industry. The marijuana industry is similar to what the cigarette industry was back in the 1950s. They have a lot of money. They're doing a lot of uh, research to try to support uh, you know, the use of marijuana. Uh, it is an addicting substance. So for that reason, I don't like it because obviously I do a lot of addiction as well. You know, I do think in the long term of all addicting substances, it's safer than cigarettes are. But uh, with conflicting long-term information, you know, or long-term outcomes, um, I don't recommend it. I do have patients who use CBD and either by mouth or they have it as an oil that they rub on their pain. And some of them think that works. We don't have a lot of evidence on that, but I do think that is safe. Um, I think a lot of its effect might be placebo effect. It costs you know, a fair amount of money, but if my patients are already using it and they say it helps, I say, well, you go for it. And, and I in reinforce that placebo effect. I say, you know, I've had several patients that say it really helps them. So I'm glad it's helping you. I think you should keep doing it. So I support CBD if they're already doing it. I don't necessarily recommend it because it's kind of expensive and that's an issue for some of our folks. Um, but I'm not opposed to CBD, but for, for marijuana itself, yeah, I'm not a fan of that. You know, I tell people if they're already doing that, I say, you know, long-term outcomes, it might make your pain worse. I just want to make sure you know that, but I don't really push real hard for them to come off of it. Could you please comment on uh, how much dose to use for buprenorphine for somebody with Percocet three times or, you know, hydrocodone yes. times? So that's a great question. How do, you, so, how, do you, how do you approach it and how do you start? Where do you end? Right. Okay. That's a great question. Um, so 
as I said, you know, buprenorphine is a cool drug. I, I've been using it for about 20 years now to treat addiction. Um, I'm not on it. I don't have addiction, but it really changed my life when I saw what it could do. Um, so for people with addiction, we put them on the sublingual formulations. It has to dissolve under the tongue. Uh, it gets very high plasma levels. Uh, they take it once a day. It prevents craving. It blocks the effects of other opioids. Uh, it's great for that. I began to see many of my patients that, that say they got addicted because they had chronic pain and they got long-term opioids for that. I began to hear them say their pain was getting better as well. So I began to look into that. And, and as we know, buprenorphine has been around a long time. When I first got out of residency, it was the drug of choice for pain relief for post-op uh, patients after surgery. Uh, because we didn't have pulse oxys back then, and all the other opioids caused respiratory depression. So you could give them big doses of buprenorphine, and they didn't stop breathing. Uh, so it was felt to be very safe, it, you know, you, and, it, and it worked well for pain. Um, but then we kind of got out of using it for pain. Then we got back into using it when the patch came available, the Butrans patch. Uh, it actually gives you much lower serum levels or plasma levels of buprenorphine than does the sublingual formulation. But if, you're, if you decide to start somebody on, on an opioid for chronic pain, you've done it for everything else, they're doing the PT, they're doing the behavioral health. Um, start with the patch, start with the lower doses. If it's helping some, then go up to the higher doses. And if you get to the highest dose, but they're still having some pain, but it's still helping some, then I switch to the sublingual formulation. I transition to that as like one milligram sublingual. It does have to be given three times a day for pain relief. Once a day works great for addiction, but it has to be three times a day for pain relief. Uh, if they're already on buprenorphine for addiction, but they have this chronic pain, just have them divide their dose up and take it three times a day. Um, some people you do need to go to higher doses. So I've got people on as much as 32 milligrams of buprenorphine a day for chronic pain, and they're doing pretty well on that. Again, very safe, not impairing. They don't develop tolerance. Um, so, you know, you kind of go to what you need to. I think there's evidence saying that we could go higher than 32 if we need to, but I don't think I've had anybody that's needed to up until now. You know, one, one thing I will mention to you, so first of all, you can use buprenorphine, even the sublingual formulation, even without the X waiver, you don't need that. I'd encourage you to get it anyway in case one of your patients tells you that they have addiction and they want something. It's really easy to prescribe. The majority of my patients in addiction treatment now that come in to see me, when they come in as a new patient, they say, I've been buying buprenorphine on the street. My dose is eight milligrams twice a day. I'd just like to get a prescription for it. So I would say that's 80% of my new patients nowadays. Uh, buprenorphine is diverted. It has a, a positive public health uh, benefit for that, for those uh, pills that are diverted. So, you know, that's another thing about buprenorphine. You don't have to worry so much about if some of it is getting diverted because studies show that the great, great majority is used to uh, uh, help people kind of treat their own addiction and gets them into addiction treatment. If they come into addiction treatment and they've tried buprenorphine already in the street, they're four times more likely to be successful than if they've never tried it before. So you don't have to worry about it so much. Uh, and it's pretty easy to get people on it nowadays. Okay, I'd like to thank, I'd like to thank Dr. Teeter for an excellent presentation and uh, for making his contact information available as well for those of you who may have any follow-up questions.